what is happening now in European, uh, in, in Europe and in, in Greece is really a tragedy. We see in, in Greece the last two months 500 uh, refugees, most of them children and women, they drown in the Aegean Sea. And this is a crime uh, conducted uh, not by the bad weather, but uh, by the governments who are closing the border, by those who are building fences in Evros River. The only safe place to enter Europe is uh, closed with a fence of 20 of 10, 12 uh, kilometers. So that's why people are dying there in the Aegean Sea, because the, the European Union wants, wants to close the border to bring more fences. They want to scapegoat the migrants for their failures, for their uh, austerity measures, and also because they want to continue bombing Syria, they want to continue war, and Islamophobia is their way to split people, to split resistance. What they are discussing now, to close the borders, to bring Frontex in the Aegean Sea, uh, and to, to build uh, huge concentration camps, is really disgusting. You know, even Financial Times is proposing to build a concentration camp in Greece for 400,000 people. And they say that uh, this happened in Europe uh, during the Second World War. Uh, it is a way to protect the populations because they want to continue bombing in Syria. All these racist lies, we have to oppose them, we have to fight them. And this is what is really happening in Greece. We also fight against the austerity measures. Last week we had a general strike again against all this blackmail by the European Union that is going on with the threat of Brexit. And there is also resistance to the other threat that we are going to get you outside from uh, Schengen. We had uh, a national march in uh, Evros, uh, which is the, the north of the Greece, with the slogan, uh, tear down the fence uh, in Evros River, open the borders, all the refugees are welcome. And we are very proud that uh, this demonstration was uh, uh, coordinated with the activists and the movement from Britain and France in, in Calais. It was the same day. And we are very proud to have this kind of, of coordination against the Europe of offences, against the, the Europe of racism. We say that uh, to, all, to all those who are continuing the war and they are destroying the houses, the jobs, the lives, the schools of uh, the refugees, that all these refugees are welcome. And we say that they are welcome in our countries. We want them to stay in Greece. We don't just want them to get passports an easy way to go around the Europe because we don't uh, have the uh, possibility for hospitality of them. <laughs> if we cancel the debt, if we stop paying the bankers, we have enough money for jobs, for uh, education, for housing, for everybody. So we try to pay the European Central Bank two billion. Two billion, it's enough money for having all these uh, social needs. And this is what, what are the Greek trade un unions are fighting for, and we are very proud of that. The future is for a Europe of solidarity, a Europe of workers resisting, a Europe of, of open borders and no fences, a Europe without concentration camps, a Europe of uh, really fighting for uh, the, the people's life and not for the profits of the bankers and, and the capitalists. And this is the real possibility for us. The 19th of March, it, it has to be a common call by all the uh, um, anti-fascist, anti-racist and the trade union movements. Let's do it. Let's go together and organize the 19th of March to say that the borders of the Europe will be open for the refugees and migrants and closed for those who are bombing, who are destroying the lives of the people. We're going to need to build across Europe anti-fascist activity that joins together, but at the heart of it, actually, to be honest, what is pushing the racist agenda? The truth of it, in this country, is David Cameron. David Cameron comes up with bad results for the economic process. He, he opens up January the 1st, he finds out the economy's not growing, and he suddenly decides that there's Muslim population in Britain, and he's going to speak out about them. He's suddenly an expert on whether Muslim women speak English or, 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 or not, or how women are dressing, or suddenly he's an expert on fashion. He's suddenly that. Actually, the truth is we're seeing a racist offensive. I'm old enough to remember Enoch Powell, right? And Enoch Powell was the, um, kicked out of the Tory party for making some of the same type of racist statements 
that, um, that David Cameron makes today. The test of a society, any society, is how it treats its most vulnerable and marginalised members. And now, in 2016, there is no group more vulnerable and more marginalised than the refugees and migrants that are making their way to Europe and trying to make a life for themselves in Western Europe. I was very, very moved alongside the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, to visit the camps in Calais two weeks ago. And I have to say to you, the camps, the refugee camps in Calais, have been there now for quite a few years. They've tried to bulldoze them, they have emerged once again, but I cannot imagine any other leader of the Labour Party would take the trouble to visit those refugee camps. <laughs> and speak to people for himself. And you won't need me to tell you that there were people in the Labour Party that didn't want him to make that visit. Um, what we saw in Calais were horrible conditions. If we as a society, and across Western Europe in fact, do step up and do the right thing in offering a lifeline to refugees and migrants, it won't just be infinitely better for them, but we will be infinitely better for this, for, for doing so. Because you know, we often speak about it, and we'll speak about it this morning, as a refugee and migrant crisis. It isn't a refugee and migrant crisis. It is a crisis of Western Europe failing to recognise its international moral responsibilities. And that is the crisis we have to challenge. Thank you very much. I think the tactics that we face now of, um, of dealing with the fascists means understanding what they are. If they come out like Jobbik and Golden Dawn, then they are hardened fascists in the Nazi style. If they come out like the Front National, and I have to say, the Front National are the most dangerous fascist group we face at the moment. Why? I know that they didn't get, the, they didn't get any sessions, they didn't get any seats in the last election that they, they took place, but taking them, they were the largest party. And the truth is, although they're disappointed, the, the reality is that they've got potential in the presidential election of coming and winning. The, they've got a chance of coming, on the, coming second on the paper. And that represents a shift in Europe that we haven't seen for a very long time. And what it represents is a deep poisoning cancer that we have. And I think we have a responsibility to actually do something about it. And we're going to have to combine a strategy of both making sure they don't grow. To be honest, I don't want to see any more of those National Front demonstrations inside um, Dover. But I actually think we have to think very carefully about how we do it. Some people said to me, what we have to do is all dress in black, go down and, do you know I mean, well, I'm, I'm already done that, but that's not the reason why I support. I don't believe that that's the tactic that, that, that did it. In Walthamstow, the tactic that did it is numbers. It's always numbers. Cable Street, numbers. Lewisham, numbers. What we did in Walthamstow, Tower Hamlet, numbers. This is what we need. We need to mobilise numbers and we need to win the question of what a united front means in practice. The 19th of March, it's very important that we show solidarity to our French brothers and sisters and to the refugees there by making sure that demonstration is as big as possible. It's about solidarity with them over the question over Le Pen. And I think it's... I want to start and with something else. In Germany, they've taken a million refugees. I know that they have had the question of the growth of the far right there. But we should take a leaf out of Germany's books and saying that refugees are welcome here. Germany's taken a million, we've taken 5,000. Actually, we have to make sure that we change that and make sure that racism isn't used to divide us and that we keep the Nazis small and divided. This war on terror, which was supposed to get rid of terrorism, actually has massively increased the level of terrorism. I just want to give you figures. I don't know if people follow this. The number of United States bombs dropped in 2015. 
added up to a total of 23,144. This was in five mainly Muslim countries, mostly in Iraq and Syria, which accounted for over 22,000 of them. And we see it's not really been successful in terms of its supposed aim of getting rid of ISIS. Nearly 1,000 in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and a whole number in Yemen and Somalia. And they, they don't ever seem to make the connection with this bombing and the fact that in most of, well, in all of those countries, you've got the growth of terrorist organisations and you've got the growth of these things going on. And I think it's very, very important that we do make this connection. Stop the War has been much attacked in recent months for saying that there is a connection between war and terror. But who can seriously say? It's not to defend any of the terrorist attacks. The people who uh, carried out the attacks in Paris were responsible for their own actions and should be condemned for their own actions. But who is to seriously say that there is no connection between these wars and terrorism? It just does, it simply does not make sense. And in fact, they know there's a connection between these wars and terrorism because many of them have said so themselves, including the head of MI5 who gave evidence to the <coughs> Chilcot inquiry, which we're still waiting for, mm -hmm. but you know, nonetheless, um, which said, we warned the government, if they attacked Iraq, it would greatly increase the level of terrorism. Spain is not a big place. There are no really massive cities like in other parts of Europe. And there's a lot of small towns and small town <laughs> politics. And in those small town politics, racism is absolutely rife. And it's really, I think, the, vol well, the, the, the voluntary work and the day-to-day the -day work of small groups which can, which can stem that racism and stem that Islamophobia and it means working, and it's not always easy, working with the local communities, making contact with people that we don't always agree with and working with people that we don't always agree with. In that day we had 17 people I think on a, on a platform that was a bit stronger, not as strong as this and was, was bowing in the middle from all the different political parties and when you talk about Catalonia there are a whole, it's not quite simple, it's not as simple as the, as the parties, there are now a whole number of independence parties of different types of centre, centre left but basically we had all of the democratic society up there with the cultural associations, trade unions, every single, every single person we could get on the platform, we put on the platform to condemn the racism and isolate the races. There are five or six places of worship in the whole of my county, a uh, population of 133,000 people, and there are 560 Christian places of worship in the, same, in the same county. So if they're trying to is Islamize my county, they've got a lot of work to do before they... Uh, 560 to six places of worship. And basically it's the racist card, openly racist, anti-immigration, anti-refugee. Hélas, aujourd'hui encore, beaucoup trop de personnes, personnalités publiques se, se, se revendiquent islamophobes. Uh, but unfortunately, even today, many um, public uh, figures actually uh, reclaim being Islamophobes. Le dernier en, en, en date étant is, uh, Elisabeth Badinter, qui est une philosophe uh, française. A, a French, a renowned French philosopher, <laughs> a woman uh, named Elisabeth Badinter. Badinter. Donc, a osé dire qu'il qu ne fallait pas avoir peur d'être taxé d'islamophobe dans une sur une sur les ondes d'une chaîne publique. Uh, said recently on on a radio program that uh, the people should not be. Um, uh, frightened of being uh, labeled Islamophobe. Je n'oserais même pas remplacer le terme islamophobe par antisémite ou raciste. Uh, if, if, uh, I wouldn't even dare replacing the word Islamophobe with racist or antisemite. Parce que là, tout le monde se serait levé pour dire non. Uh, because that would lead to everyone uh, objecting and standing up against that. Mais concernant l'islamophobie, c'est un racisme euh, respectable. But when it comes to Islamophobia, it's a respectable form of racism. Et notre premier ministre l'a soutenu. And our uh, prime minister actually uh, supported her. Les statistiques ethniques aussi sont interdites en France. Uh, in France, uh, st uh, statistics uh, on, on race uh, are forbidden. Ce qui fait qu'on ne peut pas quantifier en fait le racisme. Which means we cannot quantify racism. Et comment est-ce qu'on peut lutter contre quelque chose qu'on ne peut pas quantifier? Co how could we fight against something that we cannot actually quantify? Donc pour moi c'est vraiment ces éléments qui sont essentiels. Il va falloir euh, porter cette lutte mais par les personnes qui sont concernées. Uh, for me what's uh, essential is that this uh, struggle must continue uh, with the leadership of those at the receiving end of it.
mais qu'on ne s'y trompe pas, le racisme est affaire de tous. Uh, racism is the uh, question for everyone. Tout le monde doit combattre ce fléau. E everyone must be fighting this, uh, this disease. Je vous, je vous remercie. Thank you. So for people in this room, for Jeremy and Dan making their intelligent, uh, compassionate contributions at the highest level in Cali, this is the ultimate test. As Wayman spoke about going onto the streets and uh, I'll be in uh, Balham on Wednesday, all of the different levels that we have to motivate and energize what we have to do, this is the moment. There has never been a time when even in winter so many tens of thousands of people are coming to Greece and to Italy when a problem is so solvable, when a compassionate organized solution is within everyone's grasp, are you telling me that 5,000 people in the camps in Cali and elsewhere can't be accommodated by two of the world's richest countries? Are you telling me 5,000 people can't be In Calais, Le Pen received 50% of the vote in the first round of the regional elections. Many voters were ex-socialist and ex-communist. And why such a U-turn? In France, there is a resurgence of religiosity, which is filling the, the political vacuum. Since 91, the bombing of Muslim countries has led to terrorism. 10 years of embargo in Iraq killed 50,000 children of less than five years of age. This was never broadcast. The French, with their allies, to kill two jihadists, raised to the ground a village of 500 people. In France, the Muslims are being victimized seen as potential terrorists. After the attacks in France, François Hollande reacted with more violence in the Middle East, making matters worse. In the regional elections, two out of three young people didn't bother to vote. And this lack of political commitment goes back quite uh, to a few decades back. The main reason is that French <coughs> MPs represent a, the privileged classes. Once elected, these professionals <coughs> do not act on what they promise to do. Marine Le Pen collects the votes of those dissatisfied the, uh, 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 with the inactivity of the MPs. President Hollande is more concerned with security than stability, yet bombing Syria is increasing, increasing insecurity. And the French are not consulted either. They are not treated as responsible adults. Democracy is eroded, and the Front National recruits more people. Why not follow the example of Syriza and Podemos, trying to change the political setup in their respective countries for the benefit of the majority. That's it. When we were watching the video during lunch with um, the horrendous reminders of Auschwitz, which we never forget, our emblem has the black triangle because we were actually as disabled people amongst the first to be exterminated with the Act on T4 program when they had euthanasia of disabled children and also mobile gas chambers and I want us to remember that today because when they use the words fit to work yeah, exactly. they use those words fit to work today and we are selected for assessments to find if we're fit to work and history does repeat it goes full circles we are seeing the rise of horrendous hate crime directed at us directed at migrants, directed, <coughs> directed at our LGBT community. The thing is what we must remember, united we stand together, divided we fall. And wherever we see the dreadful rhetoric on our streets, we challenge it. Wherever we see 
a story of prejudice and hate, we fight back against it. We will be on the march on the 19th to stand up to racism, to stand up to hate, to challenge fascism. So what I will say to you is Deepak are with you all the way. Together we will fight fascism and drive it back. Together we will fight racism and drive it back. And we will bring equality and diversity to this country and tell the Tories, enough is enough, no more hate. I'm very happy to be here and to speak about the situation in Germany. All these three elements, Pegida, AFD, and a new wave of pogrom-like violent hatred against refugees are primarily motivated by racism. In many places, it has been possible for these elements to channel social discontent in a racist way and position themselves as a supposed only genuine opposition. <coughs> the slogan, Merkel must go, a phrase that has now clearly been claimed by the right is symbolic for such power play of the right. Moreover, all three phenomena promote the racist escalation of the situation. At Pegida demonstrations, participants are called upon to carry out independent justice and create armed groups. We need to link the crisis. I don't think we can talk about the so-called refugee crisis without talking about the Greek crisis, the Euro crisis, and ultimately the crisis of capitalism. We also need to point out, however, that the solutions to these problems are also linked. We don't need special laws for refugees and we don't need emergency accommodations for them. Instead, we need social laws and a human, affordable infrastructure encompassing houses, mobility and education for all. What's interesting is that when those same refugees leave the region and search for safety in Europe, it's a very different story. In fact, the closer that refugees get to UK soil, the more hostile the rhetoric becomes. Suddenly, they're referred to as migrants rather than refugees. They're arriving in swarms. They're all apparently coming to the UK. This type of language from a world leader is utterly irresponsible. It fuels fear and anxiety. It creates this sense that we're being overwhelmed. We'd like to see the government exploring the use of humanitarian visas. Let's create an asylum visa so that people can travel legally, uh, legally to the UK. But governments could achieve much, including this one, by simply expanding the, limiting, the limited existing legal channels for refugees. Resettlement is one such route. Thanks to you and all the other thousands who took to the streets and shouted from the rooftops that you wanted to welcome refugees into your communities. This government, very reluctantly, committed to resettle 20,000 Syrians over five years. That's 20,000 lives transformed. That is no small thing. <coughs> but the UN Refugee Agency has said that there are more than a million refugees in need of a resettlement place. So the UK certainly could be doing more on resettlement. But this, this country should and must play its part and do much more to help refugees in Europe. Thank you. And the real question we have to ask in the 21st century, is history going to repeat itself in that way? And I, I, I want to say no for two reasons. Firstly, I keep saying this, I said it the last time, Nick Griffin said he couldn't form a party uh, that the BNP are unable to get enough people to um, form an organisation in order to stand inside the next, e next election. I think that's a triumph of anti-fascists inside this country. <laughs> it's not, we can't rest on our laurels because anybody that was in Dover knows that the Nazi scum, small but scattered but dangerous, still remain. The people they're targeting at the moment are Muslim brothers and sisters. And I tell you, it's reminiscent of me, to me, of what happened in the 1930s when you started to frame the framework of attacking the Jewish community. And this organisation was founded by people from the Kinder Transport. And I remember and forget a man called Henry Guterman who told me that he left his brothers and sisters in a train yard on the way to Britain. And he said he never forgave himself because he asked himself this question, why me? Why not my other brothers and sisters allowed to come here? And he said that he wanted to make sure that never happened again. 
I think we're the living example for Henry to make sure that doesn't happen to other children and doesn't happen to any refugee or any migrant. Now, we have to stand up and give them voice. On the 19th of March, let's all stand up against racism and make sure we stand together and make sure that we not only kick fascism into the dustbin of history, but we also stand up for those people that have got those rights. Thank you very much. Basically for us, I think the issue really is just to keep the, the, the work going because we're trying to get these children at a stage where they're still forming their thinking. Okay, if we can get to them while they're forming their thinking, we've got more of a chance of changing their thought processes as they grow older. Some of the older people, you know, there's a, a view which I basically take of there are some people who are lost to change. So we won't waste time trying to change them, but if we can get those while they're still forming their thinking, while they're still growing and creating their mindsets, maybe we can have them help us do the work which we're all here trying to do as well. Thanks a lot. What is the picture in education? The NUT believes that the UK's cultural diversity is our greatest asset and strength. It combines and unites the multiplicity of talents, abilities, insights and skills. We do not see refugees as a problem, but rather as people to be welcomed for all their talents and rich cultural heritage that they bring to our schools and society. Education plays a key role in challenging prejudice and all other attitudes. But the government's future policies and current policies are likely to perpetuate the trend towards disadvantaging the disadvantage and increasing segregation. I want to point out to you that I have some copies of this resource that we've developed for teachers about welcoming refugee children in school. It provides teachers with lots of resources to welcome those children, to look at their policies and practices. We also support Show Races and the Red Card, and I've got some documents here at the front which also point teachers to resources they can use in the classroom. Well, at the last Hustings last week, uh, this week, sorry, uh, the Evening Standard, someone had the gall to ask in a public meeting, when are we going to shut down mosques in London? Now, thankfully, um, Sadiq and, to Zach Goldsmith's credit, responded in the right way. That's not on the agenda at all. But that's been simmering away. Um, unfortunately, though, I think uh, in, in Zach Goldsmith's campaign, there is a dog whistle campaign happening there. Uh, whether he likes it or not, I, I think there are people um, well, agitating on that front uh, in a very discreet way, but it's actually becoming more public. That's where we are at the moment, uh, and I think it's very important, whatever your uh, reservations about some, some of the leading candidates' economic policies and what their priorities may be in uh, administration, I think the most important thing that uh, we can do is make sure we vote, uh, and making sure we vote uh, clearly and uh, simply will make a huge difference because actually, um, the fascists will fall off as a small percentage. In an editorial in the magazine recently, I made a criticism of the movement and I said, I keep seeing things that are talking about race hate, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and they're talking about these people have been xenophobic and being this, that and the other. Well, as the comrade from Germany explained, these are Nazis. Some of them wear suits these days, but they are national socialists. And we, we've got to understand that when we write or talk about them, we don't describe them as being racist or xenophobes. We call them for what they are. They're national socialists, Nazis, or they're fascists. <coughs> And if we forget that and leave it behind us, then where are we going in combating them? <coughs> know your enemy. There was only 200 fascists in, in Dover, and we outnumbered them. Unfortunately, the police seemed to be more on the side of the fascists, who were throwing missiles and bricks at us, but they were on the, on the side of the anti-fascists. And I think we need to remember why we have two different organisations, Stand Up to Racism and United Against Fascism. Stand Up to Racism deals with the issue of immigration and refugees, and actually United Against Fascism deals with fascism, which is a different question. 
because the fascists don't just want to get rid of black people and Jewish people and Muslim people, they want to get rid of the trade unionists, they were the first people in the concentration camp, they want to get rid of the socialists, the Labour Party people, and everyone who was in favour of democracy. And that's why in Dover, which is an iconic place for uh, British people, the White Cliffs of Dover, where, the, where Hitler came to a stop, and so on, and the, the racists use it today to say it's where the refugees will come to a stop. But I think we have to turn the argument around and say, in your town, do you really want Nazi thugs? Seek hiding in your town, which is what they were doing in Dover. Do you want these people launching their violence against anyone who gets in their way? And I think the majority of the people in Dover who may have some problems with immigration refugees will be against the fascists. And that is the movement we have to build in Dover. And then we go on to argue about refugees as well. So the next time they try to march, I think in London, we need to have a mobilization of a coach from every borough in London to show that we are the many, and we're not about violence, but we are about isolating them and showing we are the many, and they are the few. And when they are the few, and they feel like they are the few when they get demoralised. That's how important we are. I just want to give you a, a description of what happened in Bolton uh, about 18 months ago, where the fascists mobilised to try and stop uh, rebuilding of a mosque in Bolton, and the police, as usual, did not intervene when uh, no more mosques or other foul statements were on display. They didn't intervene when a council meeting was um, actually ultimately violently disrupted by fascists, but during that council meeting where the debate took place about mosques, uh, a banner had been unfurled that said no more mosques. Greater Manchester Police did not intervene. Bolton City Council did not intervene. And therefore, I think there's some very, very profound questions about the extent to which the Islamophobia and the anti-Muslim um, policies and practices that are being carried out within our state are being accommodated by our state. And I think that's a different way of thinking about the police no-go areas, but that's what the police no-go areas are, are looking like more and more. Thank you. I just want to say something about Dewsbury, which is quite near to us, where there was a demonstration last weekend at the same time as what happened in Dover. Um, the police attacked very consciously um, that um, counter-mobilisation by local Muslims and rode into the area with their horses, charged in, 70 people arrested, all except one, who was not Muslim, um, were uh, convicted and sentence, uh, sentenced, mostly prison sentences. It was a massive defeat and it's been very difficult to sort of get any internal <laughs> resistance in recent years in Dewsbury and Batley to fascists coming year after year organising demonstrations. Last week, we're hoping a corner's been turned. It's the first time in my memory we outnumbered them. Not by very much, but we outnumbered them. It was pouring with hail, actually, for ages. It was really unpleasant physically. But everybody really felt... Uh, to tell you the truth, it was the best party I can ever remember going to. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's vindicated over the days since uh, people have been exchanging messages on Facebook and so you can tell people are re really uh, elated by that and it's, it's, I hope it's turned a corner. Phil Turner, I'm from uh, uh, Rotherham United Against Fascism and I really want to concentrate on why it is that the fascists are uh, weaker in Britain than the rest of Europe and I think as many speakers have said that is because of United Against Fascism and it is because of the United Front, uh, uh, United Front approach which I think you know we do have to go away and build UAF in every locality in I think sometimes difficult circumstances in, and perhaps in Rotherham were the most difficult circumstances I mean we've had to mobilise against 18 Nazi marches in about three years We've had, we've had the Infidels, we've had the South East Alliance, we've had the Ku Klux Klan from America. Every fascist 
pretty much in Europe has been to Rotherham because they saw the child sex abuse scandal as a way of um, dividing the town and whipping up racism and actually building, uh, building from it. I, I'm very, very pleased to tell you that we've turned that back. We've turned it back. Les politiques savent pertinemment que c'est pas euh, euh, contre une critique de l'islam parce qu'on s'en fout à la limite. Uh, the the uh, politicians know that this isn't about uh, our opposition to a critique of Islam because we don't we don't care. We can criticize Islam. Voilà. Ils savent que quand ce dont on lutte c'est les violences contre les musulmans. What, what we are fighting against is the violence against Muslims. Mais les gens qui luttent choisissent des mots pour définir leur lutte. Uh, but those of us who are struggling, we have to find words to define our struggle. Et je pense que c'est très mauvais d'être toujours sur le mot et d'être sur la réalité. Uh, and it's, it's a bad thing to focus on the word rather than the reality. We're pushing to keep the borders of Europe open. We don't accept fences. We don't ac accept all this discussion that, that uh, the European Union is pushing now by saying that all these refugees are uh, um, suspect for ISIS, for terrorists, so they want to close the border. All the refugees are uh, carrying with them uh, diseases. And all the arguments, all the racist arguments are coming that uh, there is no place for them, we don't have jobs. So come on, we are opposing all this because we are fighting against austerity, we are fighting against poverty, we are fighting against cats. So the anti-racist and the anti-fascist movement, they are going hand in hand with the workers' resistance and we demand to give shelter for the refugees, to give them food, to give them education, health and so on. And this is a, a clear picture. <laughs> for us it is very important to fight against the fascists because people are, ang are angry about uh, austerity, they are hoping for al alternatives, so we have to close that uh, door very firmly. And uh, our movement is, is very strong. What we need is uh, international coordination. And what happened on 23 of uh, February, I think it's opening the way. So for us it's very important the 19th of March. For us it's also, we have to connect with the anti-war movement. We have to say to them, stop bombing Syria. This is not the way to stop ISIS. This is the way to build support for ISIS. Stop supporting Erdogan. Erdogan is murdering the Kurds. Er Erdogan is attacking the left, is attacking the trade unionists. And it is not a solution to give money, three billion, the European Union that is given now, to stop the refugees coming. For us, refugees are welcome. Migrants are welcome. The we don't want to discriminate with them. We want rights for everybody, so we are going to fight against the governments, against the European Union, for open borders. And this is the way to stop also the Nazis and the fascists. If we confuse ourselves about uh, analyzing only the phenomenon and not really building yeah. with the workers, with the activists, with, with the minorities, with the people, build, building mass movement on the street, this is a very crucial thing to oppose the fascists, to oppose racism, to oppose the governments. We are going to, to, to lose this big opportunity that it is around Europe. The 19th of March is a great opportunity for all the movements <coughs> around Europe to organize this call. There are a lot of people who are not political, who are not in the left milieu, who are not even trade unionists, but they are ready to follow this. And, and we have to go to these people. So for us, it, it is a big opportunity to send a crucial message to our leaders, open the borders, refugees are welcome, we will stop the Nazis and we will stop the war.